Well, good morning, everyone. I know not everybody's here yet this morning, but uh, <clears throat> we need to start on time. So uh, before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have here this morning to open your word together. And uh, we pray for this movement. We pray for the people in it, those that have been searching for truth. And we just ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here, to teach us, to correct us, uh, to help us in our walk with you. Um, as we look at uh, uh, this article of Jeff's before we go back into Daniel chapter 11, we just pray for your Holy Spirit uh, to give us a spirit of meekness and that you can work upon Elder Jeff's heart and help him in the struggles that he's facing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so welcome to this study. And again, it's not going to be a very enjoyable one. Um, what we have is an article that uh, came out yesterday. And uh, so it's Future for America in July 18, 2020, number four. So... Um, what Jeff does in this article, I'm not going to go through every detail of it, um, but he's going to start uh, looking at um, the role of 1863 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, and uh, what is discovered and what is rejected. So you're going to have uh, the, the 2520 being rejected by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And... Um, and then he says here, uh, in 1863, the Millerite movement ended as those who had formerly been in the movement started the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When they began as a church, the movement ended. It ended when they slew Moses, as represented in the seven times of Leviticus 26, when they simultaneously slew Elijah, the messenger that had presented the oath of Moses to the movement. Moses and Elijah were both slain in 1863 and were not to be resurrected until post-September 11, 2001, when God took the movement Future for America back to the old paths. So in this uh, article by Jeff, so on July 18, 2020, that's the topic, and Future for America, he's going to go back to 1863 and say because of the rejection of the seven times in 1863 that they're uh, slaying Moses as represented in the seven times of Leviticus 26. So this is, um, I think, a fairly strong, a stronger statement that, that I've heard him regarding, heard from him regarding 1863. So we know that in 1863, um, that the 2520 is, is not on the 1863 chart, but it is hidden in the week of Christ. In fact, the whole, the whole uh, prophetic mirror is hidden in that. Um, so there's some very powerful ideas that once we understand the 1863 chart as a witness against those that have, have um, rejected prophecy and that those prophecies then are going to come to pass upon them. Now, one thing we have to remember is that Ellen White supports the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. So uh, the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church occurs because the church is no longer a movement. That is, its role that it was to serve as a movement fails. And so they have to form this church. So it's, it's not just a straightforward thing that, you know, God wanted this church, and so it's all good and wonderful. Um, or as simple as, you know, they had rejected the truth and now they're, they're going to become this Laodicean church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, something bad. It's not really good or bad. It's just a reality of what happened. But it is true that the, the seven times is being set aside at that time by the Adventist church. Basically, it's a rejection of um, the second angel's message. And of course, we know that the third angel's message is going to be rejected in 1888. 
So then he goes on and he says, Future for America recognized September 11, 2001 as the arrival of the third world. And what establishes that the identification of Islam's attack on September 11th was the first, was the history of the first two woes as identified by the Millerites, which is specifically represented on both the 1843 and 1850 pioneer charts. So it's a really bad sentence. So I'm not quite sure what this sentence means, but basically, Future for America arrived, uh, recognized that September 11, 2001, was the arrival of the third world. And this is established upon identifying uh, that uh, Islam's attack on September 11th was a history of the first two woes. And really, it would be a history of the, I don't know how it would be the history of the first two woes. I mean, it parallels the end of the second woe. Um, and of course, we know that's represented on the charts. By returning to Millerite history to uphold the modern rule of Islam, the Lord then opened future America's understanding of the seven times Leviticus 26, which is graphically represented on both charts, charts in the center column. And in both charts, the center of the center column is the cross. When God directed in the production of both of Habakkuk's tables, he made sure that the oath of Moses, the seven times Leviticus 26, was the center of all the other prophetic illustrations and that on both tables, Christ was placed in the very center. So he's going back to Habakkuk's two tables in which he has established the movement's understanding of things up to that time, which we can all look at and see is very solid. So um, Habakkuk's two tables is like the foundation of this message. Um, this agreed with a period of time located in another prophecy that was interpreted by Gabriel in chapter 9 of Daniel, which identified that Christ would confirm the covenant with many for one week. So he introduces here the 70 weeks, and that's something we've studied extensively. A prophetic week is 2,520 symbolic days, and the prophecy that Gabriel was explaining identified that in the midst or center of those 2520, 25 uh, 120 symbolic days, Christ would be crucified. Christ is the center of the 2520 on both Habakkuk's tables and also the week he confirmed the covenant with many. So now he's going to say some things here as he goes into talking about future for America. Um, so he goes back in 1863, Adventism began as a church and the Millerite movement that had been empowered with the spirit of Elijah was slain. So he's obviously referring here to Moses and Elijah in, in Revelation uh, chapter 11, right? The Millerite movement understood that in the context of the seven churches of Revelation, they had been the Philadelphian church. Those that separated from them after the great disappointment of 1844 were then identified as Laodiceans. In 1856, James White began a series of articles in the Review and Herald identifying that the movement that began as Philadelphia had become Laodicean and that the members needed to seek the remedy offered to the Laodicean church. In the same year, in, that, in the same publication, James White published a series, series of articles written by Hiram Edson about the 2520 year prophecy of Leviticus 26, the articles were never finished. So in 1856, the church is recognized as Laodicean and also Hiram Edson publishes uh, a series of articles. And I believe there's seven articles uh, on the 2520 where he's going to have the 20, say that the 2520 for Northern Israel should be the correct understanding of the seven times. Okay, so now this next paragraph. When the Lord led the movement of Future for America back onto the old paths post-September 11, 2001, the articles by Edson were rediscovered. And for the first time in history, both of the periods of 2,520 years were recognized as two curses, one against the northern ten tribes and the other against the southern two tribes. Miller had identified the seven times against the southern kingdom of Judah, but Edson identified the seven times against the northern kingdom of Israel. Future for America saw that they both were to be applied 
when the two scatterings are combined, they produce prophetic light that had never been recognized by Miller or Edson. So we would all agree with this. Um, and, and the thing about this is if you look at what's happening at that time in the movement, um, so in 2012, we're going to have, uh, following this, the Habakkuk's two tables, which are going to end in 2013, in the spring of 2013, you're going to have uh, this message of Ezra 7-9. Now, I'm not sure where Jeff stands on that now. But Ezra 7-9 opened up to this movement, uh, something that brought us back to understand Millerite history in a way that we would not have understood it before. And I think we can agree with that. Once we start to understand the dates in Millerite history, this opens up uh, this work um, of chronology. Right. So now we start to look at chronology and also the symbolic use of numbers in a way that we we hadn't really before. So what he's going to say in this next paragraph is rather interesting. It says when the Lord returned future for America to the old past post 2001, the oath of Moses came back to life and stood upon its feet. The message connected with the oath was then presented by the messengers of the third angel as it had been presented and typified by the messengers of the first angel. Future for America was a movement that proclaimed the message represented by Moses in the power of Elijah. And Elijah clearly gave the testimony of Moses until the conclusion of a series of presentations titled Habakkuk's Tables, which was finished around 2012. So we know it's gonna be in the spring of 2013 that Habakkuk's two tables are finished. When that series of presentations ended, the beast from the bottomless pit ascended to make war upon Moses and Elijah. That warfare began when Future for America determined to stop the work it had been doing since 1996 and begin a school which, in its pride, it's called the School of the Prophets. Better it would have been to call the school the School of the False Prophets. So, <clears throat> uh, what do we think about this paragraph here? Hi, Dwight. I know you, you just came on here, so I don't Good know. Good morning. I, I on. saw this article last night. So you read it? Yep. Okay. Okay, so good. So you've had some time to think about it while you were asleep. And uh, um, so it's it's a pretty serious topic. I mean, what, what Jeff is saying is that uh, Habakkuk's two tables – is the testimony of Moses and Elijah. It's the testimony of the two tables of that message of the return to the old past. But when he began to do the school of the prophets, he actually began a work which is uh, the work of the enemy, right? That is the beast from the bottomless pit, bottomless pit ascended to make war upon Moses and Elijah. And, and so that, that this basically was a mistake. The school of the prophets, it would have been better to call the school the school of the false prophets. Any comments on this? Do you agree with that? Well, obviously not. I don't either, so. No. I mean, there's as much illogic in this as there was in the other, other article that we read. So, so first, when we harsh language, yeah, but when when we look at uh, what Future for America had built upon. So, for instance, my study was always going back to what was done before. That is to understand uh, the light that God had given uh, to this movement and also to Adventism. So, my work at that time was basically the work of biblical chronology. Sorting out the 2520, trying to understand the chronology of it, uh, to understand the chronology of the Babylonian captivity. Now, if we're going to say that the movement start, stops at Habakkuk's two tables, that it's it was basically slain then, because that's 
that's what he's kind of saying here, um, that these prophets, Moses and Elijah, are going to be slain and you know, thrown into the streets, so to speak. Um, that what followed with, for instance, Ezra 7, 9, would have been um, the beast from the bottomless pit ascending to make war upon the message of the 2520. And, and we can't see that. So when we look at, um, you know, Ezra 7, 9, for instance, I mean, these are things that are just coming out of everything that has been studied. So everything is an unfolding of established truth. There's Now, it is true that there are people in the movement, such as Parminder and others, who are teaching error. Um, so let's see what he says in this next paragraph. Uh, so he says, the chaos and confusion that ensued when the school began, allowing those who had never been confirmed by the Lord as his messengers to introduce their own ideas, ended with the death of Future for America on July 18, 2020. At that point, Moses and Elijah had been slain in the streets. So, so he's going to say, basically, uh, there's a war being put upon Moses and Elijah. It's going to begin. It would be in 2013 after Habakkuk's two tables are done and they're going to have this school of the prophets uh, begin in 2013. Um, that um, that there is allowing those who had never been confirmed by the Lord as his messengers. So how do we decide if somebody has been confirmed by the Lord as God's messenger? How would we decide that? Well, the first thing I think that we're going to have to look at is when the Lord sends a messenger, mm -hmm. they're going to be speaking and living according to the word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, we had many that were at the school of the prophets that looked as if they were doing this. But time <clears throat> time came through and revealed that they really weren't. Right. So, but when he's saying here, those that have never been confirmed, how do you decide, how do you know whether somebody's been confirmed or not? I mean, who decides that? I mean, I'm not really sure what what this would mean. I mean, who's deciding whether somebody's confirmed uh, to be introducing ideas? I mean, he's saying that pe messengers are introducing their own ideas. And since it ended with the death of Future for America on July 18, 2020, we'd have to assume that these false prophets, these people introducing their own ideas that are not confirmed by the Lord, would be people like me, right? I I wouldn't see that's that's a direction I don't think I would take. Well, I, I know, but I'm thinking that's the direction he's taking. We don't know that though for certain. Well I mean at know. this at at this point one of the things that that Elder Jeff said and he said it multiple times yeah. was that he himself had trusted in many of the wrong people. Right. Now, this was being applied specifically with many of those that thought they were to be leaders in Future for America but prove themselves to be unworthy. Now, right. the situation that we have right now, we have looked at what was where the problems were on July 18th. 
We mm-hmm. have established the validity of July 18th without, I mean, it, it's without a doubt in my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there are those that wish to be critical about the use of biblical symbols. Especially numerical symbols. Especially numerical symbols. Because they are unwilling to trust Palmoni, they want to trust in their own understanding. So one of the things we would see here then, you know, for instance, were Parminder and Tabo and um, the other guy, were they confirmed as his messengers? Not by God. Right. But the movement confirmed them as messengers, right? And we know, and we know that Jeff was the Lord's messenger, and he is going to then ordain these other people and place them in a position to be leaders in the movement. Okay, so I'm if we go back in Scripture just a little bit, yeah. Who would Samuel have first selected? after Saul to become king of Israel? Well, probably the eldest son of... uh, um, The eldest son of Jesse? Yeah, Jesse. So, if not him, who? Well, he definitely would not choose, you know, David. Yeah, he... See, that's the whole point. He would have gone and made these choices... Now, was Samuel confirmed of God? Yep. So was Samuel, I mean, in in all that he accomplished on behalf of Israel, would he have been right to have taken the eldest son of Jesse as the, as the king of Israel? Well, it wouldn't have been right because David was the one that God had chosen. Right. So the point is that Samuel had to go through a progression thinking that surely this, surely this, surely this, until he finally comes to the youngest son of Jesse Mm -hmm. to confirm him Mm -hmm. as king of Israel. So I don't see that Elder Jeff was any different than Samuel in this situation. Well, and uh, yeah, and in this sense, I mean, we know that it's not, it wasn't up to Jeff to decide who was going to be his successor, so to speak. Right. Which Jeff agreed. But he did pick people to, you know, all throughout the ministry to be leaders, and they all seemed to be the wrong person. But so I don't know what I don't know is what he means had never been confirmed by the Lord as his messengers, how we would determine that the way that I would determine that is based upon the message that they give. All right. Right. So because if they're giving a message that's consistent with God's word and that makes old light shine brighter. then God God has chosen that message. And I don't think it's that important about his messengers particularly, because I don't think this is about individual people here. Um, You know, everything that has come to this movement hasn't come because of some person. It's come as a result of of the Lord's providence, Mm -hmm. almost in spite of the people. Right? I would agree. Yeah, so he's going to quote then in Revelation 11, verse 7 and 8. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So, I mean, if you're going to count 1260 days from July 18, 2020, you'll come to December 30th, 2023. That's 1260 days, whether that means anything. But um, 
so he's 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 going to apply this right because you know after three and a half days which would be three and a half years they're gonna get up and prophesy again but anyway so he, he's applying that to to this message of ffa that was given to it to the 12 25 20 so then he says the testimony that is trustworthy is the testimony that ended at the conclusion of the series titled Habakkuk's Tables. So he says we can only trust up to 2013 in the spring. Then the beast attacked. I have no idea who is following these current articles, but I assume it is made up as much by the enemies of Future for America as it is by those who are still trying to come to terms with the disappointment of July 18. Now, I find that sentence kind of odd. People who are still trying to come to terms with the disappointment of July 18. Well, we came to terms with that disappointment fairly soon afterwards. Now, he could, I'm not sure what he means by the enemies of future for America, uh, whether that includes us, are we the enemies of future for America? And, and those who are still trying to come to terms with the disappointment of those that are, are still disappointed, not really the enemies of Future for America, but they, they're trying to figure out what happened, how did, how did this all go wrong? I, I kind of think that's, that's what he's saying. So he would look at us as the enemies of Future for America, and that those who are still sort of scattered and, and bewildered by what happened uh, those are the disappointed ones trying to come to terms with what happened. So I, I therefore expect that those that are in the category I define as enemies will point out how self-serving this application of prophetic history appears to be in their minds. So be it. Time is too short to pretend that the history of Future for America is not clearly identified as the movement that had been typified by the Millerite movement. And it is too short to pretend that the flawed laid to see in human messenger that was raised up to lead out the, in that movement was not typified by William Miller. So if this is correct, that the Millerite movement is parallel to Future for America and that Jeff is parallel to William Miller, then after July 18th, the disappointment William Miller's testimony regarding what happened is not what is to be followed, right? Okay. So by paralleling himself with Miller, he qualifies himself to comment about July 18. Wouldn't that be true? That could seem logical. Right. Well, based on his logic, based on what he's presenting here, based on what we know about William Miller, we know William Miller, we don't follow Miller after October 22nd, 1844. He's, he's, not, he's no longer leading that movement. And God raised up other people to lead a movement, to address the disappointment of October 22, 1844. And that's going to be, you know, James and Ellen White and, and those that later on, uh, you know, put together the 1850 chart. And then, you know, 13 years later, end up uh, uh, forming the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I don't see how Jeff can escape that reality, especially since he seems to accept it. Now, he's going to address something that I've always had trouble with um, when I see people doing this. So I've run into this, I've run into this for you know 40 years as an Adventist, and you probably have too. Now, Miller was a Philadelphian. So the Philadelphia church, when would we place the Philadelphian church?
Wouldn't we place it from September 11th, 2001 to July 18, 2020? Isn't it from August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844? Yes. Okay. So... So we may be Seventh-day Adventists, and we are the Laodicean church. It's the last church, right? So the Laodicean follows the Philadelphian. Philadelphian is that movement. And we had in our history something that paralleled that Philadelphian church. That would have been that history uh, from 9-11 to July 18, 2020. I, I would think we would have to parallel that history. And even, you know, if we are going to sort of zoom in, we could say it's from November 9th, 2019 to July 18, 2020. You know, if, if we wanted to do it that way, but I, I still think we would probably go back to September 11th, um, you know, with November 9th paralleling, uh, you know, the second angel's message arriving in April 19th, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844. So the, that, so that that movement of the Philadelphian is is something that's prophetically it's it's a prophetic waymark, right? That it is somebody can't just become a Philadelphian, right? I've, I've run into this idea. People say, "Well, you're Laodicean, but I'm a Philadelphian," right? Because I believe Philadelphians are the ones who are going to be. You know, the 144,000 are different ideas people have had. I don't know if you've run into people like this talking about the Philadelphia. But it's not something you can just do. It comes because of prophetic events that place you there. Would you agree with me on that? Or does somebody disagree? I don't think I would disagree. So, so Jeff is saying, well, he came into Adventist Adventism from the world in 1975. So he's a certified Laodicean Adventist. Now in studying Jones, Jones is quite clear that we are Laodiceans, that we have to believe the testimony that Christ gives in regard to us. And I don't believe Laodicean means a person is lost. I think it's just the condition of the final church, the message that is given to the final church, that, that there is a need that exists in this movement presently that we would parallel to the Laodicean message. That is, we think we're rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, but we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is Christ's testimony of us. And if we don't accept that message, if we think that message does not apply to us, then it proves our Laodicean condition, right? That's the cool thing about the Laodicean message. Right. Uh, you're caught in this trap. You can say, well, I'm not Laodicean. And in that very statement, you're proving that you are. So our responsibility is to recognize Christ's testimony about us. That's the remedy that's given to us. Okay. So he says, uh, uh, that being said, the merciful God of heaven has recently instructed me to put the message he is now revealing into writing and send it to the churches. His instruction came with the promise that when he resurrects Moses and Elijah, they will be resurrected as Philadelphians, not as Laodiceans. The movement that began in the Millerite history was the time of Philadelphia that ultimately transcended into Laodicea. And I probably mean, he probably thinks he means descended into Laodicea in 1856 when it began the process of its rejection of the foundations laid by the Millerites. The rejection began with the setting aside the new development of light, light offered through the pen of Hiram Edson. Seven years later in 1863, the movement of Elijah, which had presented the message of Moses, was slain. At the same time, the movement was slain. 
A church was introduced to replace the movement. Moses and Elijah were slain at the beginning of Adventism, and they were slain again at the ending of Adventism. So we can see again, there's a lot of illogical ideas here, which, which I'm rather surprised by. So if Jeff accepts that he's Miller, he can't possibly have been instructed after July 18 to put this message into writing. Because if he's doing so, if he was instructed to do so, it would counter, it would contradict what he's already said. Right? That's evident. Yeah. And, and so Jeff had made the correct decision not to be involved, recognizing that if he was to be involved, he would be fulfilling the role of Miller after October 22nd. And yet he can't help himself. He's going to do it just as Miller did. He's going to reject the light that God was unfolding in regard to the sanctuary. That's what Miller did. And, and Jeff is going to reject that light too. He's going to do exactly as the type shows. And we can't be resurrected as Philadelphians. Because that, that's, not, that's not how it works. Philadelphia happens, then Laodicean happens. That's what happened in this movement. It never goes back to Philadelphia. Wouldn't that, that would require us, like you just said, or it seemed to indicate, to go backwards rather than to go forwards. Right. Now, we can say, well, Philadelphia, that's way better than Laodicean, right? right. Doesn't have a rebuke. It's the church of brotherly love. Laodicea is this lukewarm church. But that's just God describing what happened prophetically, what was going to happen prophetically. We had this church, the Millerite movement, that was the church of Philadelphia. It was followed by Laodicea. Laodiceans can't go back and become Philadelphians unless you have a repeat of history, which is what this movement had, right? With this repeat of history, we could then repeat the conditions of these different churches. Correct. And we experienced that Philadelphian period from November 9th to July 18, 2020. Once we come to October 22, 1844 to July 18, 2020, we now become Laodiceans within the context of the movement, right? That is, and that's what we saw, that's what we see. And the message that we need is the message to the Laodiceans because that is the remedy that God is presenting to us at the present time. We need to see our spiritual condition for what it is. And July 18 exposes that. So we have this light, this new development of light, which God has been unfolding since July 18, 2020. You can't reject that light. So to say that we, we, we have to go, we have to go back and become Philadelphians uh, and, and ignore everything that God has given to this movement since 2000, the beginning of 2013. Um, it's illogical. It, make, it makes no sense whatsoever. Right. So it's 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 very disturbing. I mean, I almost you know, I want to laugh just because it's painful. I mean, it's painful to see Jeff doing this. And the other thing that's painful is that there is many people who are going to rejoice in these articles. But they're not going to have light. In this. <clears throat> Well, I could well I could see yeah. laughing ironically. Reading yeah. through this yeah. re reading through this article <clears throat> would lead me to weep. Yeah. Well that's you know, 
Um, this the the whole the whole situation with this. I'm the the concept of having to turn our back upon the light that has already been presented is a fearsome thought. Mm -hmm. Because what happened to those that turned their back on light? Well, they go off the path and go into darkness. Correct. Now, there were those that were around Father Miller that kept him from accepting the truth of the Sabbath, right? Yes. And of course, not just the Sabbath, but also the sanctuary message as well. Okay. Are we not seeing a type of parallel with this article? Yes. We're definitely seeing the parallel. And you know, when it when it comes to, you know, Miller was kept from really even hearing the message, except filtered through um, the words of others. Right. Right. So other people had their opinions. They would tell Miller about what these fanatical groups are teaching. And he would just, that's what he would know. Now, I know it was, I can't remember when it was. I could probably find the email, but there was... Because I used to send Jeff, you know, links to our studies. And there was a certain point where he asked to not receive any more studies, right? So we'll move him from the mailing list. And now it is possible Jeff did that. I had a feeling, though, it wasn't Jeff that did it. But I could be wrong. It could have been Jeff who decided. But definitely there was an influence. I mean, I personally couldn't do it. I mean, if I was in Jeff's position, I would want to know what people are teaching. I would try to study with them and understand what's going on and, and to have some kind of, um, you know, perspective on it. Right. But there was a lot of things happening that, um, uh, that obviously are going to bias Jeff to doing that. Right. So the things that happened when we were there in 2018, getting kicked out of school of profits, Jeff wasn't there. He wasn't a part of it. He doesn't know what actually happened. Um, and then, you know, what, what happened during that that period, you know, 2019 into 2020. Uh, I mean, definitely I'm pushed on the outside um, of things. You know, I've, I've never been confirmed by the movement as, you know, God's messenger or anything like that. You know, what he's talking about, the idea of, if confirmed means, you know, I was made, you know, a, a member of FA or some kind of, you know, anointing or ordaining or anything like that never happened to me, which, which I was always thankful for because I really don't think that it's helpful at this time in earth's history to have men authorize who is sent of God and who isn't. I don't think it's a safe thing to do. I think what people have to do is study God's word for themselves and decide if a message is true or not. Because we're not to be following people. We're to be following Christ. And Christ is going to give light from all different places. And to me, that was the beauty of what I saw in the movement, um, especially, you know, after 2012 is we started having a flood of light from all different directions. And and Jeff was sort of the, uh, you know, the focal point. He would take this light and focus it and help us to look at it and examine it. And, and I think there was a great deal of humility in how he did that. Because I don't think many leaders would do that. So this this idea that this was pride, the school of the prophets came out of pride, you know, calling it the school of the prophets. You know, I don't I mean, I probably wouldn't have called it the school of the prophets, but, you know, I don't think it was pride that did that. I, I mean, I don't see that pride in Jeff. In, in that history, I don't see it. I see somebody who's 
willing to follow wherever the Lord is leading and to allow the Lord to lead rather than be a dictator of a movement. But there were people around him who definitely did want to control what was happening in the movement. Right? Because when we think our ideas are important, that our insights are, are to be the guide, um, we end up shutting out light. Instead of just trusting that God knows what is truth and what isn't, and, and that we need, to, we need to examine it for ourselves and support that which we know to be true, but to be much more receptive to things that we're not sure we understand. Right, to allow things to work out. And I just thought that's what Jeff was doing. But there was others who didn't want that. So, um, <clears throat> so he says here, at the ending of the prophetic Laodicea in 1989, the vision of the Hittico River was unsealed and a movement began that was born of a Laodicean mother. The Lord was taken unaware and he knew that he would finish his work of the three angels as he began it he would end it with the movement of philadelphians just as he began it and in order to do this the movement was that was laid to see him by birth would need to be slain and resurrected as philadelphians in doing so the movement that was brought out of the laodicean church would become the eighth that is of the seven in the very history where the threefold union would become the eighth that is of the seven and in this very same history, the horn of republicanism will also experience a resurrection of the eighth that was of the seven and had been slain by the wokeism of Egypt and Sodom. Uh, but that line of prophecy will be addressed later in the articles. So this is this is kind of, I guess, the point that that comes here, why he's introducing this idea. Now, can we apply this? in this way. I don't see how. Okay. So, I mean, we know that there's a message to, of the seven trumpets, right? There's the message of the seven churches. There's the message of the seven seals. Are we going to take each one of these and have an eighth? That is of the seven. I don't see that we can. Yeah. I mean, the where where in the Bible, with the exception of the one location, do we find an eight of the seven? Do we do we find that with the seven trumpets? Do we find that with the seven seals? Yeah. Well, what we can do that is consistent is that we can see that a reform line has seven way marks. Right? Three messages in seven waymarks, correct? I would agree. Okay. And that then we do have an eighth. We've drawn that many, many times. But that eighth is another reform line. Right? Because it's going to be it's going to be the second angel's message repeated, what we call the fourth angel's message, but it's going to okay. be okay. So we have that happen in, in these histories. So we do have a model for it, but the model for it is, is different than what he's suggesting. Because I'm saying that, yes, we do have, after those seven way marks of Millerite history, we have the Revelation 18. So we have this 3-1 combination. But in that repeat of history, Revelation 18 is a repeat of Millerite history. Um, and in a sense, it's a repeat of, you know, and Jeff did some studies regarding these seven churches and how we would up, reapply them again. And what you would do is you would take 1989 and place from 1989 to 9-11 as Sardis. And from 9-11 to July 18th, 2020, as Philadelphia. And then you would say, now we are Laodicean. 
Now, he never quite had it that way, but he did, right? Just not the exact dates or way marks. But we could see that we have a progressive destruction of four, the first four churches, with the last three churches occurring from 1798 to 1863, right? Or 1856, however you want to look at it, right? That's how we would understand those churches. We're going to have, in 1844, the Laodicean church is going to come. But, you know, it doesn't really come until, what, 1850 or 1856 or however you want to look at it, wherever you want to date it. But it's still, it's still going to be, you still have to have all of the seven churches to get that repeat of history. Okay. So you, so, can't, just, so you can't just take the Philadelphian church out of that and just place it at the end by itself. That's not how it happens with a reform line. So okay. in, in the way that in the way that you were just stating this, mm -hmm. are we are we using the premise that the Laodicean church arrives on October twenty second, eighteen forty four? Yes. And that it then needs to be formalized. much as what we've been dealing with, with the, the messages of the three angels of Revelation 14 and the message of the, the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Right. So you're going to have it first in Millerite history that you have that repeat of history, right? So you're going to have that. In that first generation, you're going to have the eighth, right? You're going to have a falling away. That happens. But you're going to have a repeat of history ultimately, which is our history, where we're going to see first the first four churches you would apply as a repeat from when the Seventh day Adventist church begins until 1989, right? You can apply those first four churches there with the four generations of Adventism, however you want to lay it out. I don't think it's important exactly how to define exactly those those periods, though we generally go from 1844 uh, to 1888 as the first generation. So that would be Ephesus, right? And then the second generation is going to be Smyrna, and that's going to be 1888 to 1919. Then you have Pergamos, right? So that's going to be 1919 to 1957. And then you're going to have uh, Thyatira, right? That's going to be the fourth generation. And then you have, in that fourth generation, a time in the end. And then you're going to have those three churches, Sardis, uh, uh, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. So if we're going to apply that, that's how we would apply Philadelphia coming again in our time. That would refer to that period of time that Jeff is here rejecting as, especially if you're going to deal with the period from November 9th to July 18th as a period of the beast from the bottomless pit slain uh, Elijah and Moses. And then he's just going to want to say, well, we're just Laodiceans. And now we need to go back to Philadelphia, but you can't get back to Philadelphia without going through all of the churches. And if you're going to say, well, it's of the eighth, which is of the seven, that eighth in, in the context of a reform line is another reform line. So it means you have to repeat all of those churches. So we've already had that Philadelphian experience in this movement, which Jeff is calling basically the period of the false prophets. And so he can't just jump back to be a Philadelphian. I mean, how do you do that? You just can't do it. You know, you can't just become a Philadelphian again. You have to just take the counsel that God has given us now, which is the counsel to Malaya to see it, because that's where this movement is presently. So it so it's I mean, I can see how he's trying to fit this in 
this wokeism of Egypt and Sodom, that's going to be Parminder's stuff. But of course, that has nothing to do with us, right? So, because he's saying now it's slain, slain by the wokeism. Well, before he said it was slain by, wasn't wokeism that slain, that led to July 18, 2020, was it? No, it wasn't. Yeah, so I, I, I just find it, you know, really inexplicable um, that he can do this, right? So he's going to, you know, have this revelation 11 verse 9 to 11. So you can see the 11, 9, 9, 11 there. That's going to tie, tie you into um, uh, September 11th and November 9th. So we can see that this does apply, right? We can apply this history, but not in the way that he's applying it. Okay, and then he has, so he says, future for America did not get put into the grave. It just laid there in the street where it had been slain while its enemies rejoiced over its apparent death. Yet after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Time is no longer. So the three and a half days is symbolic of 1260 days or years that in Revelation 12 verses 6 and 14 represent the wilderness where the sanctuary and the host were trodden underfoot. If they had been put in the, into the grave, they would not be in a street where they could be trodden down. The treading down of future for America is not only a symbolic period, but it is a symbolic period of the message of the seven times represented by the Mo oath of Moses. So of course, they're not gonna attach time to it now, right? We're just gonna say it's symbolic, okay? And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So we know that's talking about the 2520 for northern Israel, right? Because the times of the Gentiles is not the 2520 for Judah. Okay. <clears throat> Correct. So, yeah. So he's, he's, um, Okay, so Iran says, when FFA resurrects, will it have a completely different message? Well, it appears to. Already, the message is different. And, and there's no way that it can't be. That is, as Jeff recognized, everything that this movement had happened to it all came to a focal point on July 18, 2020. If you try to get rid of July 18, 2020 and say, well, that was all error. It's, it's the same problem that you have um, with rejecting uh, October 22, 1844. Because if you just say, well, October 22, 1844 was a deception. How is it any different than the cross and the resurrection of Christ? Because you have a disappointment there. Is every disappointment then a failure on, on the part of God or, or part of us understanding God's message? And we'd have to say no, because these disappointments come from an understanding of God's message. And they bring us to a point where we then can um, come to understand what God is trying to teach us. So if we reject July 18th, we reject the message to the Laodiceans that's going to correct us. We're not going to see ourselves as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this is the problem that I have with the messages that are being given within the movement. These are the messages that are... Um, trying to justify self 
rather than to recognize our sins. And, and they come in a way of, you know, for instance, you know, after July 18th, before December 6th, there was this call to basically apologize to the people of Nashville for what we had done in saying that Nashville was going to be destroyed by a nuclear attack by, by Islam. We needed to apologize. Um, and I'm not trying to be d dramatic, but you, I, I would say that that was an insane idea. And why do I say insane idea? Because what is insanity? A person being double-minded, right? Schizophrenic. Well, if God... Yeah, if God hasn't been leading you and you've been under deception, what you need to do is repent to God and change your ways. But everything that was being talked about was a way of trying to save face. And even the interpretations of, of trying to get things to somehow, you know, July 18th wasn't really, really a failure in the sense of it's going to happen again, right? We're just we just need another date or, you know, Trump, you know, you know, the Trump prediction needs to be uh, revived so that we can we can again predict some exact event so that people will then recognize we were right. You understand what I'm saying there? We need to know that what God gave us was true. It's not about what anybody else thinks about it. And we need to know why God gave us this message, because we need to be corrected on a spiritual level. We need to recognize what our problems are. And the things that are our problems are the things that we keep trying to avoid. We don't want to see ourselves as sinners. We want to, we want to justify everything we do so that we look good. And the reality is, we're not good. We need, we need to be corrected. And so, so the message of the Laodiceans applies to us. Not, not the approval of the Philadelphian message. That's not going to help us. Right. Because if we look at it, it's the messages to these churches. What good would a message do that has no rebuke for us at the present time? So if we look at Revelation chapter three, let's just go there. So remember, you're going to have Sardis first. That's going to be 1798 to August 11th, 1840. Okay. And then you have the Philadelphian church. Now, some people try to put it, you know, to the spring of 1844 to October 22nd. But I would put it in that whole period that Alan White calls a wonderful manifestation of the power of God that she parallels with the Exodus. And Angela put it uh, here in the comments. I don't read of Jonah apologizing to Nineveh when it wasn't destroyed at the end of 40 literal days. He had to be corrected of his self-righteousness and self-pity as we do. Yes, so I agree. So when we look at the message to the Philadelphians, um, uh, to the angel of the church, of Philadelphia, uh, church in Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them go, make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept thy word of my patience. And I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world 
to try them and to dwell that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no, go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we know that this is the message to that movement that is going to pre predict Christ coming in 1844, right? And there is no rebuke given. It's the only church where there's no rebuke given. But the council is what we need to listen to. Right? Now, we have some promises in there as well. Now, in this context, the key of David that brings us back to Isaiah 22, 22. Um, and... Uh, we know that this is, is going to refer to Christ moving from the holy to the most holy. So it has its prophetic fulfillment in the Millerite history. And we know that we're repeating Millerite history. So we know that we repeated this church. Um, and it talks about those that um, are the synagogue of Satan. And they're, they're going to come down and worship at our feet, right? So in understanding this, this is not talking about in this time. This obviously is at the end of time. So by being faithful through all that period of criticism, we can trust that, that in the end, God's name will be vindicated. And, and so we can look forward to that. We don't need to have it happen now, right? We don't need to be vindicated personally because um, God has his time for that. So we have to keep the word of his patience. And he says he'll keep us from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. So we'll be able to go through the time of trouble. And we have to hold fast, which thou hast. Right. So these are the things that God has given us, the truths and the light that he's given us. And then there's promises made about being a pillar in the temple of God. Right. <clears throat> so if we're going to say that this is the Philadelphian church. I mean, we, we could say, well, there's there's a people at the end of the time. They, these promises are to them. And I, I think we can apply all of the promises in the messages to the churches to us. But as far as a point in history, the Philadelphian church is a period of time. And it's followed by the Laodiceans. And that is where we are, not just as Seventh-day Adventists, but as people in this movement. We've had our disappointment. But yet we don't recognize our spiritual condition. So. <clears throat> now, I know this is, has been a departure from, uh, you know, what we have been studying, but you can see how it's related. He's going to talk about the three times that Jerusalem was trodden down, Babylon, 6, 677 to 607. Um, I'm not sure what he means by that. Uh, was did Babylon tread Jerusalem from 677 to 607? Wouldn't that be from 607 to 537? I mean, I understand. I think what he's trying to do, but. I mean, if you're going to start in 607, I mean, you would have to at least go to 537. You could say 140 years because then would it not be from from 609 to 539. Yeah, well, yeah, and that would be more correct. You're correct. 
right? So you're going to have the 70 years for Babylon. So I'm not sure why he's using 677 to 607, okay? And then we're going to have um, the trampling down by pagan Rome six, from 66 to 70 AD. So we can accept that. And then we have 538 to 1798. So this is the treading down of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. Now, um, in the prophecy of chapter 11, when uh, these when the testimony is given, so I'll just uh, go back here. Um, okay, so. Um, so chapter 11, there we are. Now, who this the, the Gentiles are going to uh, tread it underfoot forty and two months. Okay, so we're we're going to have this uh, treading. So this is going to be the papacy, right? So he says there's three treading downs. We have a Babylon, and then we have uh, pagan Rome, and then we have papal Rome. And I, I think we can agree with that. Okay, let's go to his paper here. <clears throat> so he's going to uh, quote these verses here. Um, then the command for John to measure the temple and the worshipers therein represents the opening of the judgment in 1844, where the previous two verses identified John as having experienced the bitterness of the great disappointment in 1844. Then after he is told he must repeat the work of proclaiming the message, Verse 1 of chapter 11 identifies that judgment has begun. So um, so there's going to be this uh, um, in this verse here. So he mentions this um, the previous two verses identify John as having experienced the bitterness of the great disappointment. So that would be in chapter 10. Um, verse 10 and 11. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Right? So that's what he's talking about the previous two verses. Okay. So then he's going to measure the temple and its worshipers. So this is going to be the judgment. Now, um, so obviously it's it's going to be addressing the period from 1798 to 1844 is um, part of that measuring. Would people agree with me there? He says it open. It represents the opening of the judgment in 1844. But I'm saying it includes that that whole period from 1798 to 1844 as the opening of the judgment. Right? Because in, in Revelation 14, when we saw these the three angels uh, coming, uh, the first angel's message is. Um, for the hour of his judgment is come. Not that it's coming. Right. So in a certain sense, that the first two messages are part of that judgment, but they're going to culminate with the Day of Atonement, October 22, 1844. Does that make sense to people? Or say somebody want to correct me there? Okay, so, so he's going to talk about this period of time. He's going to talk about Moses and Elijah. Um, and about the times of the Gentiles, you know, from 723 B.C. to 1798. 
divided into two different periods, the pagan power, which is, uh, now he says here something which I don't agree with. Uh, that treading down began with the trampling down by a pagan power. Now, does uh, paganism trample or tread underfoot God's people, according to the Bible? So it doesn't, right? You know, it's the papal power that does that work. So then he says, paganism scattered and trampled down literal Israel. Now, paganism scatters, but papalism tramples, right? So Daniel 12, verse 7 refers to the work of papal papalism or paganism, pardon me, uh, scattering God's, the power of the holy people. And Daniel 7, verse 25 refers to papalisms treading underfoot. So he says here, the times of the Gentiles represent 2,520 years of Leviticus 26. That represents two periods of treading down. And I don't agree. There's a period of scattering and a period of treading down. So there isn't two treading down periods. I mean, I'm being a little bit technical here, but it's something Jeff should know. Now, he says something else here. The first was carried out by paganism as represented by Assyria, then Babylon, then pagan Rome. Now, we know, of course, in 523, it's going to be Assyria that begins this work of scattering, right? So, so that would be then Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then pagan Rome. They're all going to do this scattering. So the sacred, the second desolating power that Miller identified in the sacred framework of prophecy he employed was papalism, and that would continue the treading down until 1798. So it does the work of treading down. Right. So in, in Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, that's Balmonai, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily? and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So if you just read this super, superficially, you'd say, well, the daily treads underfoot and the transgression of desolation treads underfoot. Right? That's why I think he's using this verse. But it it doesn't say that that um, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In this context, we, we can say that the, the earthly sanctuary is trodden underfoot. And we can say that pagan Rome did tread down uh, Jerusalem, right? We could say that. So I'm not saying that there is no treading down at all. Because this is going to have to do with the work of destruction. But the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot, primarily this is God's people, the period of persecution that happens under papalism. Okay. And then the angel Gabriel and the other angels led Miller to understand the daily represented paganism and that the transgression of desolation represented papalism. Right. So he's just going to go into a bit more here about the 2520. And then he talks about the three days and a half. And he says he's going to address this truth in the next article. So we have another article we're going to have to look at. Okay. So very disappointing uh, article. It's a mixture of truth and error. But it's a rejection of this message. So people need to evaluate it.
So where we were yesterday when we finished our study, and uh, we, we can look at this and, and sort of uh, address this in the context of what we read. Okay. <clears throat> now, if we're going to, if we're going to take Jeff's position, so he's saying that this message is understood basically in 2012. Everything after 2012 comes from an attack by the beast from the bottomless pit. So if that's the case, what is it that we're throwing out? Can we take these lines, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, whatever, can we take this as truth? Does this happen after 2012? The four seven times in the context of um, the seven kings, last seven kings of Judah. That's 2013. That's going to be in August 2013. Now, is Jeff going to keep this idea? Or is he going to throw it out? So are we going to accept uh, the first seven kings of Persia? You kind of see the problem that, that he's going to face is how do you decide after 2012, any of the light that we received, whether it's light or darkness. I, I don't know how you can go back to 2012. So he's just saying that, you know, that that message of Elijah and Moses are slain. And they're lying on the streets. They're not in the grave. They're not dead because they're going to be resurrected. And, and he believes that he's resurrecting that message. So that means we don't have Ezra 7, 9. But do we have these lines? Yes, we have these lines. But the, the situation to answer or attempt to answer your question is yeah. that if if we go back to 2012 and we are rejecting the light that has come since then. We would have to reject these lines. We'd have to reject all of them, but wouldn't we also be rejecting, since you have it up here as a line, the application of the presidents of the United States as emperors of Rome and as being the symbols relating to those that were in the um, medio persian empire right so so all of this would be light after 2012 so you know the election of trump our prediction regarding trump uh, obviously as ezra, ezra 7 9 all of the the insights and i'm saying the insights into the four seven times because these are related, right? That is, everything is intertwined. Uh, you can't go back when you have a tapestry and start pulling out threads that you don't like. Because what happens to the tapestry? It falls apart. Right. So I don't see how you can go back to 2012. Now, a person can say, well, we're going to go back to 2012 and reevaluate all of the things after 2012 and just pick and choose the things that we think we like. But they're all intertwined. That is, the understanding we have of the four seven times. So that's the last seven kings of of Judah, um, they're tied up into an understanding that's expanding above that, right? 
So, so Jeff in 2013, he's going to be introducing something that's not part of Habakkuk's two tables. Is he going to repudiate that? Is he going to say, you know, he's going to retract that and say, no, that wasn't light. Well, yeah, Angela says it sounds like a repeat of the edict of December 6, 2020. So their declaration of December 6, 2020. It says we it says that we can go back. We can go back. We can resurrect Moses and Elijah. He's not really clear exactly how he's going to do that. Um, but one thing he's not going to do, and he hasn't appeared to have done yet, is actually address and whether he could do it or not, I don't think it would be very easy to do to go through and show where we're incorrect in what we did. You can say it's incorrect. You can say it was all just a deception. People brought in all these ideas. But how do you show that and demonstrate? You can just, you, you can say, you can sort of, Say the people who are presenting them, uh, they are enemies of the truth in some way. But I don't know how you would do that. I know for me personally, you know, if somebody's going to say everything you were teaching was wrong, then I would say, well, show me. Because if I'm wrong, I need to be shown that I'm wrong. Not, not that I'm stubborn or anything like that. But I'm not going to just accept that that I was wrong based upon somebody saying that I'm wrong. There has to be something more than that. There has to be something in God's word that would show that. And that was, of course, the problem I had, you know, after July 18th, where people said, well, you know, you can't use numbers in this way. You can't use dates in this way. I'm like, well, how can you do that? How can you say that we can't when we can and, and that it gives light to Adventism. Doesn't, it doesn't destroy Adventism in any way. Now, we know that error was mixed in with this movement. We know what Parminder was doing. Um, other people had other ideas as well. But I would think that what we're trying to do here is to just understand the truth based upon God's word. So, you know, can we show that the first seven kings of Persia have a relation to Millerite history, to the messages. Does, does, do the three decrees parallel um, the three angels' messages? We can say, yes, they do. And we definitely didn't have that prior to, to, to 2012, right? Stephen, how early can we go back to Jeff paralleling the the three the three decrees with the three angels' messages and the time of the end and etc.? How far can we go back to get that? Uh, well, I would imagine it would be after Ezra seven nine. Yeah. So so after Ezra seven nine. I would think so, because um, it's definitely related to it. So, so Ezra seven nine opened up all kinds of things. If we're going to reject Ezra seven nine, I would find I have a hard time doing that. But you pretty much have to, if you want to reject July 18, 2020 as being of God, you have to reject Ezra seven nine. I just don't see how you can can do otherwise. Okay, so we're we're going to come back to this hopefully tomorrow morning to looking at what's in front of us here. Um, you know, it's obviously pretty discouraging seeing what Jeff is saying, um, and people are going to have to decide about it for themselves. How much he's going to try to resurrect. Future for America, or he's going to create you know, 
an organizational structure in some way, uh, have camp meetings, those types of things, I have no idea. So you're going to start doing videos again. I have no idea, right, what, what he's planning to do. But it, it doesn't seem wise uh, to reject the light that has come through God's word. So, so we're going to have to wait and see and, and see how that affects the movement. And anyway, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we had this morning. Our hearts are heavy for Jeff, for his family, um, for those that we love who are in the movement and have been in the movement. And um, we know, Lord, that, uh, that this is a difficult time uh, to see what Jeff is writing. And um, we know, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan. So we pray, Lord, that these things can bring this movement uh, back together in unity. And um, um, I pray for the Canadian and American groups. I'm not sure how they're reacting to all of these things. But we pray that you can be with them. And be with us throughout this day and bring us back together to study your word. According to thy will, we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.